Hi, I'm Eric Voss. Uh, I mean, Philip Molina. Eric's busy doing The Walking Dead breakdown and HBO just dropped six freaking seconds of new Game of Thrones footage and I was obsessively ranting about it anyway, so we figured, let's put that nerdy panic attack on camera. Here we go. All right, now the bulk of the footage, though, again, six seconds, was actually sandwiched into the middle of a preview of all the new stuff HBO has coming this year, but they did open on what I think is a new shot from this season. We see a murder of crows or a manslaughter of ravens flying over what appears to be the wall. A lot of people said that this is just a repeat of one of the opening scenes from last season where Bran sent his war collective over the wall to spy on the Night King's army and it gets disrupted by this bitch glare. But I checked and this shot definitely isn't part of that moment. So I'm thinking we got a couple options here. Either Bran is up to his old tricks, either using his Raven War G to again spy on his future self's army. See our uh, Is Bran the Night King theory video for more on that. Or maybe he's sending them to see what's up over at East Watch by the Sea. I guess more accurately, what's down? <laughs> I guess this could also be uh, non wargy ravens, maybe sent by the survivors of East Watch with a message saying, ouch. And uh, while that one doesn't make as much sense to me, it's worth acknowledging that there probably are survivors since the end of the video shows a quick shot of Tormund giant beard. And though it's not a new shot, it could be a clue that he somehow made it out alive. The shooting script for last season's finale actually did imply that they were headed towards some sort of zigzag stairs that might be on the portion of the wall that's still standing. Maybe these? Now, moving ahead to the six seconds of new footage. Uh, the name of this video, by the way, is It All Starts Here. And while it clearly is about HBO and all of its programming, I think it's also a clue about when this footage is from. I'm pretty sure everything we've seen so far, all like 12 seconds, has been from literally the opening moments of season eight, which like, ugh, HBO, why won't you release a full trailer with more stuff in it? Is it because of asshole YouTubers who scrutinize the footage frame by frame and potentially guess everything that's gonna happen this season? Damn you, Emergency Awesome. All right, let's take a look. Okay, so first thing we see in this block is this shot of the awesome migrant caravan full of tourists from Essos, including Drogon flying overhead. Obviously, you can tell by the weather and fog that they're in the north, but our best guess looking around here in the scene, it's actually just outside of Winterfell in the area known as Winter Town. Real creative with the names there, George. This is where all the Winterfell adjacent stuff happens. This is also where Tyrion gets to know Roz, where those two orphans got to know Theon and where Brian got to know stalking. Now, let's take a closer look at who we're seeing here. The Unsullied are marching alongside some Dothraki blood riders. I think that's Quono there. I'm glad to see that these groups are still getting along so well. It must be these fashionable new scarves that they all got for each other. Actually, it is worth pointing out that this synchronous marching means that everyone has fallen in line under their general, Daenerys. These famous lockstep columns are often associated with the order and discipline of the Unsullied army, rather than that loose formation of the Dothraki that they even held last season. By the way, if you wish it had been the other way around and the Dothraki would have come to be the larger influence in Danny's army, one, you must be really into riding into battle rocking some fierce, smoky eyeliner. And two, you've probably never heard of the Battle of Kohor. Actually, uh, I gotta tell you this badass story because it's the definitive Dothraki versus Unsullied story. And it's one of my favorites in fictional military history. However, I get it. If you're not studying for the AP SOS history exam, you might wanna just get back to the trailer stuff. So go ahead and skip to this time if you don't wanna hear this story. Go ahead, skip. Okay, nerds, the Battle of Kohor. This takes place, uh, say, 400 years before the events of Game of Thrones, shortly after the Doom of Valyria, which was most likely a string of volcanic eruptions across the 14 volcanoes that surround Valyria. The most fierce warriors and most of their dragons were completely wiped off the face of the known world. That meant that the rest of Essos was ripe for the taking. So the most fierce dudes left behind were the Dothraki. It was only dragons that gave them any fear, which is why now they're so taken by Danny's dragons centuries later. But under the big bad smoky eye-line call of that time, called Temo, the Dothraki sacked and burned every town they came upon. No standing army could stop them. Even though the Dothraki didn't use shields, they didn't hold tight formations, they didn't even wear armor. They would still run right over the heads of the weaker soldiers like a hot pot of liquid gold. Their one killer tactic, other than neck opening, was using their horseback archers to fire upon your infantry as they rode in, and then they'd fire another wave of arrows as they swapped in a second wave of horse riders, each wave sliding in under the other, nonstop brutality, kinda like a sweet Dothraki braid. So when the city of Kohor, yes, you're hearing that right, got word that the Dothraki were coming their way, they were like, well, 
shit. So they built up their fortress walls, they doubled their city guard, they hired two companies of sellswords, including the Second Sons, which you might recognize as the same group that this guy is from. Oh, you don't recognize that guy? Right, because he quit playing Dario so he could become the new face of the Transporter movies? How'd that work out? <laughs> okay, so you actually might recognize his new face instead. This guy, Dario and Harris. So now Kohor has a legit army with their own cavalry pitting horse against horse. Two horses enter, one horse leaves, winner gets the girl. Horse. She horse? They've also got all these cell swords, and then finally, just because it'd be weird if they had these random cell swords and just a bunch of horses, they decided they needed some normal looking infantry men to just fill the lines. So they're like, fine, let's buy 3,000 Unsullied from Astapor, and then they can just get all chopped up for us, buying time for our real soldiers to do some actual fighting. Oh, and 3,000 could sound like a lot, but I forgot to mention Kaltemo was riding around with a force of 50,000 Dothraki. So yeah. 3,000 versus 50,000. Kind of like my high school fighting my college. So many awkward nerds just slapping each other. Jeez. So the one annoying thing about the Unsullied, remember how they like marching? Yeah, that's all they do. They don't ride horses. Probably rubs them raw in a very tender spot. So it was gonna take them a bit longer to get back to Kohor. Meanwhile, Kaltemo wasn't patient, so he just attacked and was actually super pumped to see a somewhat formidable force waiting for him. The cavalry and all the cell swords, that was the most legit looking resistance his group had encountered since they started on their Pillage People World Tour. Only the hits and the stabs. By the end of the opening first day of battle, yeah, all of the cohort's cavalry was dead. And the cell swords, like the super badass Second Sons, yeah, they all ran off when things got scary. This is probably what Jorah Mormon is referring to about the Second Sons way back in season three. The Second Sons have faced worse odds than one. The Second Sons have faced worse odds than run. <laughs> Okay, so Cal Temo lets his men take a well-deserved break, take some naps, eat the horses of their enemies, you know, guy stuff. So they go to sleep and when they wake up, they find a group of 3,000 eunuchs blocking their path into Kohor. And you might not find a eunuch scary, but one, they've been through some shit, and two, if you turned a corner and ran into 3,000 eunuchs, you'd probably be like, yeah, y'all can have it. But Cal Temo ain't scared. He's still got pretty much 50,000 horse riders, and Dothraki think a man not on horseback ain't no man, so they charge right at them. The Unsullied, they just point their spears and lower their shields and held the line. 18 times the Dothraki charged and 18 times the Unsullied held the damn line. And that signature move of the Dothraki where they'd rain arrows on your men as they rode in and rode out. Well, the Unsullied were so good at being a tightly held synchronized unit, the men in the front would block the riders and then everyone else would join their shields over their heads, creating a massive unified shield blocking all the arrows. Over those 18 runs, the Dothraki lose 12,000 men. I'm sure the horses were fine though. Also, Cal Temo, yeah, he dead and all his sons dead. The new Cal sees that they lost and orders the Dothraki to do the same thing Eric Voss had to do at the end of eighth grade. They cut off the hair braids and admitted defeat. So that's the story of the Battle of Kohor and why you can actually say that one badass eunuch is worth almost 20 smoky-eyed horse riders. All right, back to the teaser. Before we move on from the shot of the Unsullied, I'm gonna point out that the spears, take a close look, they don't seem to be made from dragon glass yet. Even though last we left them, they were mining tons of that to defeat the army of the dead. Call me crazy, but my guess is they made them into a bunch of dragon glass bullets and Grey Worm gets an Uzi. Also, it's not totally clear, but their breastplates may or may not be covered in leather. If not, and they're about to battle in Winterfell during winter, then Sansa would like a word. Are they covering those breastplates in leather? No, my lady. Shouldn't they be? Once the real cold comes? They should indeed. Pardon me, my lady. Who the? Why isn't there leather on these? I don't know. And now, right before we see Arya, I want you to see the look on the face of every other major character when they saw a dragon for the first time. These faces are all best described as, just shit my pants. Meanwhile, look at Arya. She's smiling. Everyone around her is running away in terror and she's never been happier. This is what I imagine Sid from Toy Story looked like when he found his first lighter to melt toys with. But actually, sadist or not, this moment is actually a huge payoff for the Arya in the books and in the show. In A Storm of Swords, Arya dreams of one day seeing great things like the Titan of Bravos, which she saw a few seasons back, sea monsters, which would be amazing, and dragons. But also, this excitement on her face is a payoff to the foreshadowing made all the way back in season two, episode seven, in this fantastic conversation where Arya, trying to pass as a low-born serving girl, is chatting with her master, Tywin freaking Lannister. This scene's amazing because it's loaded with super high steaks layered over a dinner scene of eating steak, or uh, mutton, actually. If Tywin finds out who Arya really is while her mother is holding his son hostage, then best case, he'd hold her hostage if 
not just straight up kill her. Meanwhile, Arya is debating killing Tywin in this very scene every time he turns his back. So while they chat, despite Arya trying to keep her identity secret, she can't help but give off clues that she's too educated to be lowborn, with the biggest piece of evidence being her recollection of old non stories of Harrenhal burning. Specifically, she knows way too much about Aegon Targaryen's sisters and fellow dragon riders. Aegon Targaryen changed the rules. Aegon and his sisters. It wasn't just Aegon riding his dragon. It was Rhaenys and Visenya too. Correct. Student of history, are you? Rhaenys rode Meraxxus. Visenya rode Vega. She had a Valyrian steel sword she called Dark Sister. She's a heroine of yours, I take it. Clearly, Arya is so obsessed with the images of these two fierce warrior women, specifically Visenya Targaryen, that her excitement almost gives away her secret. In fact, if you watch the scene again, it probably does give it away. Also, if you watch the scene again, you might catch something else you might have missed in the first viewing. This seems to be a moment where Tywin, having given his dinner to Arya, is actually showing to possibly have a soft spot for a precocious young girl who maybe reminds him of his daughter. And while that may still be true, you're also missing the real reason he gave her his dinner. Having just survived an assassination attempt, Tywin is having Arya eat his food as a test to see if it's poison. Not telling her that is a win-win for him. He comes off just fine either way. So anyway, Arya's clearly obsessed with dragons and specifically badass female warrior dragon riders. So theory, we've seen in the other teasers that Sansa seems to be giving a good old welcome to Winterfell ice glare to Daenerys Targaryen, but I'm thinking when Arya meets the Dragon Queen, it'll be a different story. And considering that Littlefinger taught Sansa to prepare for all wars in her mind at all times, is this going to cause a rift between Sansa and Arya and Jon? Kind of feels like it. Okay, but deeper theory that's more fun to me? Sure, Arya might like Danny. Hey, nice to meet you. You're a god of dragons and you ride them. That's cool. But Arya doesn't like the idea of meeting Visenya reincarnated. She wants to be Visenya. And so I ask, what if she will be? Aegon the Conqueror was definitely the leader of the pack, a mighty king, enemies beware. However, Visenya was the badass fighter. Listen to this passage from Fire and Blood and tell me who it sounds like. Visenya here is telling her brother Aegon that his guardsmen ain't shit. Even with your sword Blackfire in your hand, you're only one man and I can't always be with you. The king pointed out that he had guardsmen around him. Visenya drew her sword Dark Sister and slashed him across the cheek. So quickly the guards had no time to react. Your guards are slow and lazy, she said. I could have killed you as easily as I cut you. You require better protection. Damn, Visenya! But also, totally sounds like Arya! And seeing as how this exchange led Visenya to create the King's Guard and her to lead them, couldn't you see that being the role that Arya is destined for? Royal protector of the King? Maybe Jon Snow, who happens to be her brother just like Visenya and Aegon? Or maybe this exchange could happen between Arya and Daenerys, and it's the Queen she ends up being sworn to protect. I think Arya being Visenya reborn would be damn perfect, except it's too bad she doesn't have dragon lore. Lord blood, so she can't ride a dragon. But hey, maybe she can like take his face or something? That'd be pretty cool actually. Of course this only works out if Arya survives Game of Thrones, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say as long as she keeps changing and adapting, she's not gonna die. It seems that George R. R. Martin kills characters who refuse to change. If they're too stubborn in the game, off with their head. And before we wrap up, obviously Arya's about to meet Danny, and I told you how I think that will go, but she's about to have so many reunions. First off, her and Jon. Remember how emotional you pretended to not get when Jon and Sansa were reunited? Jon and Arya were way closer. He's the one that gave her needle, and now they've both gotten really good at sticking people with a pointy end. That's gonna be so amazing. She's also gonna reunite with another brother who's probably changed even more than she has, Bran, though I think that'll go exactly how it went when he was reunited with Sansa. And the three-eyed raven. I don't know what that means. So, were you like always kind of autistic or? Anyway, Gendry, that's another crazy reunion. Back when those two last saw each other, there was definitely some will they won't they energy to it. You'd be my lady. And here's something cool, if these two do get together, it would be a surprise payoff to something Robert Baratheon said way back in season one. I have a son, you have a daughter. Might not be the kids he was talking about, but still pretty cool. Also, I just like the idea of these two falling for each other because then we'll get to see Gendry all confused by tree carvings that say, no one loves Gendry. Of course, instead, I'll probably be all freaked out by her just like Hot Pie was when they reunited. It's like guys just can't deal with a powerful, murderous woman. Speaking of people Arya's vowed to murder, she's also bound to reunite with the Hound and Melisandre. Joy, what a fun party we have in store. It'll be interesting to see if Arya sticks to her murder mantra because they clearly have new priorities now. I'll say that there might be a clue in in her costume these days. Back when we saw her first arrive in Winterfell asking to be let in, she was literally wearing rags. Now she's dressed in Winterfell's finest. She isn't the simple assassin she was when she first got back to Westeros. She's now a new hybrid. Each layer is representing a different time for her. She's got the skirt and lace jerkin with capped shoulders in the style of Bravos, and her first
first fighting teacher, Cyril Farrell. Above that, she's got her leather vest along with her pulled back hair, very Ned Stark. But then when it comes to the traditional Stark cape, she's the only character on the show to be shown with it formed asymmetrically. She's adapted it to allow quick access to her sword, which most Westerosi men don't worry about since they usually enter battle with plenty of warning. This represents her scrappy time with the faceless men. So my point is, is it possible that she's grown past the need for vengeance? While it's fun to imagine her crossing off all the names on her list, and it does very well for my OCD, it could be her downfall too. We know how George R. feels about characters that stick too close to their plans. But what do you think? Is killing people like Cersei more important than helping the North fight off the White Walkers? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know what you think of my theories of where she's gonna end up in general. There's one that I've mentioned before that actually has her becoming queen of Westeros and married to Jon Snow. It sounds crazy until you find out their love was a big part of an earlier draft of the books. It was a whole love triangle between them and Tyrion. Weird. Also, there are some shots at the very end of the trailer, but they didn't seem new and no, that one moment is not John Warging. He's just looking away from the camera. Though actually the shot of Ice Viserion might be new since it's not nearly as dark out as when he blew up the wall. So maybe that's new. Let me know what you think about that too. You can hit me up on Twitter at BMO and follow me on Instagram at Philip Molina. Follow at New Rockstars for more about Game of Thrones. You guys, it's weeks away. Like six weeks, but still. Also, we're gonna have a fun new show to coincide with the premiere, but we're gonna tell you more about that later. Anyway, this has been fun being back here. <laughs> Hey buddy. You told them about my brain? They had to know. Look, someday all the dark secrets about you are gonna come out. About what you've done. Where's Gabe? <laughs>